We're going to be talking about um, discipleship and how it looks like specifically in Awakened Groups uh, t- this morning. Because if you've been with us, uh, we've been in the series called Who We Are. And uh, in this series, it, it's really the Lord put the series on my heart as because we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of a lot of things and we're kind of settling back in. But one thing that I felt like the Lord put on my heart was that uh, we need kind of a reset. We need to go back to like the basics, the foundations of why do we do church? What's the point of all of it and get just this baseline understanding. And so if you're new here, uh, you'll be like, man, I came at the end of a series. Don't worry. Next week we start a new one and we're going to go verse by verse through the book of James. So I'm really excited about that. So, um, but um, today I just kind of want to recap where we've been. Uh, we talked, uh, for the first week, we talked about what is church. And that's a, that's a huge topic. That's a huge thing to tackle. And so we were just trying to get a baseline understanding of, of what is church, what is it all about, why do we do it. Uh, we then talk, moved on and we talked about who's the head of the church. And we said, well, is it the people who've been at the church the longest? Is it the person who gives the most? Is it, you know, the, the pastors, the leadership team? No, we said it's the Lord, that Jesus is the head of the church. He's not only just head of the church corporately, like right now, but he is the head of, our, of us spiritually, that he's the one leading and directing us in what we need to do uh, with our lives. We should be seeking him in, in what we do. Uh, Then we started talking about, like, okay, who are we really as people? Like, you know, when we gather together, we are to pursue holiness. We're to worship. We're to uh, be people of prayer. That's what we are to do. That's what we're to be about. And then we talked about um, that we're actually on mission, too, that the church has been given a mission, that um, it's, it's the Great Commission, that we aren't just supposed to gather in these walls and that's it, but we actually have a mission to tell people about what Jesus has done in our lives. And so today, we're just going to dive in a little bit deeper on that Great Commission, and we're going to focus in on, well, what is discipleship when Jesus says it? So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter uh, 28. Matthew chapter 28. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Uh, if you, have, you probably have a smartphone. You can download the YouVersion Bible app. And not only are there a lot of reading plans on there, but also on Sundays, you can go to the More tab, the Events tab. You'll see Awaken Church Live. Click on that, and uh, you'll be able to see all the verses, the outline. You'll be able to take notes there as well. Uh, it's a great tool that I would encourage you uh, to use as well. But uh, Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to be uh, today. And uh, starting in verse 18, it says this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, Breezy, we're talking about discipleship. What do you see when we talk about this command to make disciples that Jesus tells us here? What are you seeing in in this passage? Yeah, and it's super interesting because like you said, Devon and I and the leadership team, we've really been praying over what does it mean to grow as disciples, to be a disciple. And I realized in order to know what that means, I have to know what the word disciple means. Um, And it's a very... I'd say churchy word that gets thrown around a lot that I didn't ever really look into um, until more recently, um, really in depth over the last couple of years and this last year specifically. And so disciple, what disciple means is we've always kind of talked about it as like a follower of Jesus, but it goes beyond that. And um, to be a disciple is to be a student or to be one who learns from a teacher. And it's this student-teacher relationship isn't the way that we think of it kind of modern day, whereas like in public schools or um, in college where you um, kind of live at home and then you go and you have a different teacher for every subject in school and they just impart knowledge um, to you and then you're supposed to take that and do what you will with it. Um, A lot of us just well, at least I did. I studied at home and then took the test. And once the test was over, I just kind of dumped it out of my Me brain too. and moved on. I don't know if I'd recommend that, but that's kind of how the student teacher relationship um, very much looks current day. But biblically, that looks very different. To be a disciple or a student of a teacher meant to 
go where that teacher went. You would eat what that teacher ate. You do what they did. You would imitate them because you were learning from them as an example for your life. And so with that, you could only physically be the disciple of one person. Um, you weren't able to have multiple different teachers because your life was devoted to learning from one teacher wholeheartedly. And so what Jesus is saying is that he is telling his disciples, his his followers, the people who are learning from him, hey, go out into the world and make disciples, make more followers of me, more students of me. And as I was looking at that, I realized, okay, that's all well and great, but how do I do that? Like, what does that actually look like practically? How do I make disciples? How do I make people a student? Um, and Jesus kind of lays it out here. Um, first and foremost, we need to share the gospel with people. And that's what Nate hit on a couple weeks ago. You can't be a follower of somebody or a student of somebody if you haven't been told the truth of who they are. If you haven't accepted the truth of who this person is and deem them worthy of, of following. Um, and so first, we need to tell people the truth of the gospel. Um, and when people accept that, those who do accept it and believe in who Jesus is. Then it says, Jesus says to baptize them. Um, and then he says to teach them to be obedient to um, all of the things that I have commanded. And this is very interesting because I think it's so easy for us um, as the church to get caught up in, hey, I've told this person the gospel. They accepted the truth of who Jesus is. They got baptized. And then we kind of move on to the next person because we're so excited and we just want people to hear about Jesus and accept him and, and be baptized. But the truth is there is such an important part that sometimes we often miss. And it's the last part of this command, the Great Commission, um, to teach them to be obedient to all that the Lord has commanded. And so part of making disciples um, is that teaching to walk in obedience. And as I was looking at that, it really stuck out to me um, that believing in Jesus is not the same as being a disciple of Jesus. They are two different things. It's possible to believe in who Jesus is and what he's done and not actively be a student of the things that he has asked us to do. It's possible to believe in who he is and not pursue holiness and not walk after him, not learn from him, not have our lives look um, the way that he's asked them to, to look. And I think that that is one very important aspect because being a disciple, genuinely being a student of Jesus, that comes at a cost. That comes at a cost of leaving who we were behind, our old life, our old desires, that, that sin nature behind, and wholeheartedly pursuing obedience into who he has called us to be, the truth of who he has called us to be. And Jesus talks in the scriptures all the time about the cost of being a disciple. There is a weight and a cost to that um, because it means leaving what we're comfortable with. It means leaving the things that um, maybe feel more natural to us or the things that we even just innately desire to pursue him and the things that he says are good, to pursue holiness and righteousness. Um, and there's, there is a cost associated with that, with being a disciple. And so um, one of the things that is so important with this to not only make disciples, but to also be a disciple is we need to teach each other and walk with each other in obedience to Jesus. Now, it's also really, really important that this command that Jesus gives, he gives it of, hey, make disciples of me. Jesus is saying that. He's not saying, hey, you go and make disciples of yourselves. No, remember, it is impossible in this context for you to be a student of more than one person. And that truth rings true today still. Like if we are a disciple of Jesus, we are learning from Jesus through his Holy Spirit, through his word. And yes, we have people come alongside us and teach us what it looks like to follow him. But we are learning first and foremost 
from his example and who he is. And that concept of we are making disciples of Jesus or we are disciples of Jesus and not another person um, was not always communicated super well when I was growing up. It wasn't really talked about. Um, And it led to a lot of misunderstanding on my part of what discipleship meant, what it meant to be a disciple, what it meant to be walking alongside other people. And I just wanted to know, what was your experience with that? Well, and and we talked uh, like many months ago about this idea of discipleship and what it meant and what it looked like. And, And I told Breezy, I said, I didn't really ever get that. I never like got discipleship. Uh, I remember I came to know the Lord at a really young age, um, but I really didn't start following him until I was in high school. So probably about like 15, 16 years old. And I started following the Lord then. And, and, but nobody, like I always heard that phrase, well, somebody should be discipling you and you need to be discipling somebody else. And, but I was like, everybody would be like, oh yeah, Nate, you should do this, or you'd be so great at that. Or, but nobody was like coming alongside and showing me anything. And I always was like, well, what's wrong with me? Like, am I broken? You know, I put on deodorant, like, come on, like, I'm not offensive. I shouldn't be that bad. If people see these things, why, why is it that nobody is discipling me. But the reality, one thing that I I realized was like, well, if nobody's going to do this, well, I'm just going to start reading God's word. And that's what I did. As a teenager in high school, I read through the entire Bible and I started living those things out and I started going to church. And when I went to church, I started seeing things in people, habits, things that as they were following the Lord, I was like, I want to mimic that. I like that they're doing that in their life. And so I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. Um, but I never really had that formal discipleship. And I think it was very confusing to me as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so interesting because we have very similar stories in terms of growing up and not having somebody to quote unquote, disciple us the way that we were always told that we needed to be discipled. And um, I, like Nate, I accepted the Lord. I believed in the Lord at a very young age when I was probably about four, but I didn't actively start pursuing to be like obedience to the Lord until I was 16. Um, And that's when I was really convicted by the spirit to, to walk after the Lord and to seek after him and to live obediently to, to his word. Um, But I, I didn't, I still at that point, I had the conviction of the Holy Spirit and this desire um, to walk with the Lord, but I didn't have anybody actively showing me what that looked like, how to practically do that well. And so it was something that I mistook as, okay, nobody is, is doing this. Nobody holds that position in my life. Therefore, I must not be a disciple. And realizing I was very wrong in that thinking because when we actively strive to be a disciple of Christ, to be obedient to who he is, to live according to his word, we are a disciple. And to be a disciple, you do not, it does not mean that there has to be somebody walking alongside you in that. But when we walk alongside each other, when we teach each other to be obedient, there's a lot of things that are overcome through that, that like, I didn't have to go through on my own, and that I shouldn't have had to go through on my own. I kind of fumbled my way through a lot of life until somebody came up and said, hey, let's walk together in this. Like, let me show you what this looks like. And so um, that's one of the things that really stood out to me of we can be disciples of Christ without somebody walking alongside of us. However, We are meant to walk alongside each other because that obedience is just amplified in our ability to be obedient and to follow the Lord and to um, have that accountability and that growth is just amplified when we are surrounded by other people who are also actively striving to follow the Lord. Yeah, and so my thought was, the, the one thing I was going to ask you is, how does gathering together really help us grow as disciples, that, that idea? Yeah, and so I think the way that we're able to grow as disciples comes through, one, knowing who God is, knowing who Jesus is, knowing who he has called us to be, who we are in light of who he is, and also, how has he called us to live? And he reveals those things, um, 
several different ways, but the three that um, really stood out were through his word. Um, we can't know who God is if we are not actively in his word, reading his word. This is, this is the truth about who he is. He has laid it out there for us. And unless we are actively seeking and studying his word, we can't know him better or the desires that he has for us. Um, he does lead through his spirit. That's the second way. He convicts us and he will reveal things to us um, through his spirit. Um, but he also reveals things through his people. And as his people are walking with him, as they are growing, as they're learning um, alongside, we are able to come alongside his people and do that well. Um, and so one of the things is when we gather together, there is an element of a Ability. There's an element of um, just like confession of sin. There's the element of being able to imitate um, one another. There's so many different elements, the element of encouragement. Um, I know we're going to hit on a lot of these, but like all of these are elements that when we gather together are just amplified. Yeah, and the Bible does talk over and over and over again about the importance of meeting together, of gathering together. And so um, Breezy just outlined a few of them. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a starting point for us. But um, we want to just point out uh, four things of when we gather together, what can happen. And so uh, I'll start with the first one. It's when we gather together, we find people worth imitating. We find people worth imitating. In fact, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He says, um, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, again, kind of going back to the same point, Paul is not saying be my disciple because we, that's not what he's saying He's because he did not pay for the sins of the world. Jesus did. And so what he's getting at is he's saying, as you're following Jesus, as I'm following Jesus, as I'm pursuing him, as I'm living a life worthy that, that is of the calling of that, to, to live as a disciple of Jesus, as I'm working out my salvation, he's like, follow me as I'm doing this. And so, in fact, in other places, in Ephesians, he tells us, hey, be mimickers, be imitators of God. Philippians, he also talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He also says, be imitators of me as I'm following God. So I think often what I got from that is that Paul's ministry is more like show and tell. Uh, kind of like, hey, I'm going to show you and tell you about it as well. And I think that's a great example for that. It's like, hey, I'm going to show you and tell you what it means to follow the Lord. And so when we come together, whether we have somebody who's willing to tell us things, we can, like I did, see people who are following the Lord and say, I want to imitate them as they are following the Lord. We're not trying to make a bunch of Nates. We're not trying to make a bunch of Breezies. We're not trying to make a bunch of, of these people. We're trying to make people who are following following the Lord. That's who we're trying to do and make people want to follow him and followers of Jesus. Absolutely. And I, I love that example of the fact that we are all students of Jesus, but we can be imitators of each other as yeah. we are students of Jesus. Um, and so the next one um, that we've got is when we gather together, we are able to correct and redirect each other. Um, this idea comes from Galatians, um, directly from Galatians 2, but I'm going to read Galatians 1 and 2. Um, it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, when this is referring directly to that, that weight and that burden of sin, um, when it talks about bearing each other's burdens, this goes beyond the everyday heaviness of life or, or the difficulties of life. Um, what is being talked about here in Galatians is directly related to the weight that sin brings and this ongoing struggle that we have to turn from the things that are not pleasing to God, things that um, we should turn away from. From and put on our new self and to um, walk with each other in what does it look like to turn away from our old self and put on the new self. Um, restore, that idea of restore, it means here, um, what does it say? To strengthen, 
to complete or to make one what he ought to be. Um, so when we are restoring people by walking alongside them and bearing their burdens, we are saying, hey, we need to redirect to who the Lord has called you to be. Not who I want you to be, but who the Lord has called you to be. And so if somebody is under that weight of sin, um, we are able when we gather together to walk alongside them and say, hey, I'm going to walk with you in a better direction. I am going to walk with you as you walk through this in pursuit of the Lord. Yeah, and that, that correcting and redirecting can only happen, though, is if we're willing to be honest with other people with where we're yeah. at. Uh, and that's the third thought is when we gather together, we can confess our sins to others and before the Lord. I think so often we've got the, well, I could confess my sins before the Lord, right? Like 1 John 1, 9, like, um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Like, we've got that down. And of course, we should. We need to confess our sins. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So we need to have that confession, but there's that other side, that other element that we need to do, and that is confessing our sins to each other. Because when that happens, there's healing, there's growth that happens. And like what we're talking about, there's accountability, Accountability doesn't have to be a negative thing. Um, it's actually a positive thing, and it helps us yeah. grow and, and not be, and, and continually, like the Bible says, not being children of the darkness, but being children of the light. We're continually growing to be more and more like Jesus. Yeah, and absolutely, and that idea of it, there's confession and there's prayer, but it's the same as where there's that between believing in Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus, there's a difference between, okay, I've confessed my sins, I've prayed about it, and then the accountability that comes in actually walking in a different way, walking in the way that honors Christ. And when we gather together, we're able to, to do that well. Um, the last one that we've got for today comes from Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And it says, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you say, see the day drawing near. And um, from this, we, we're able to, to glean that when we gather together, we remind each other of who God is and how he has called us to live. One of the things about encouraging one another is not just meant to be like, hey, you're doing a really great job. I think that's how we look at encouragement, of just telling people, hey, keep on going. You're, you're doing awesome. Um, but encouragement is to remind people of why we are pursuing what we are pursuing and the hope that we have in Christ, the reason that we strive to be obedient. And so this encouraging and building each other up is reminding each other, hey, this is who God is. This is the truth of who he is, and there is hope, and there is joy found in that. And yeah, sometimes there's conviction found in that, you know? Um, and the it's this encouragement is the building up of going a new and better way, a different way than what our nature always pulls us back to. And so we are meant to um, encourage each other and remind each other of who God is, um, who we are in light of who he is, because we are different because of who God is. We're not different because we just woke up one day and decided, I'm, I'm going to change today. I'm going to be a little different today. No, we are different because we are in pursuit of a holy God. And so we remind each other of that truth. And then we're also able to remind each other of this is what he has asked of us. This is what it looks like to be holy. This is what it looks like to strive after and pursue the things that he has written out in his word. And so when we meet together, we are able to encourage each other in those things, in those truths, and we are able to pursue those things together. And so one of the things that meeting together, all of this kind of... Um, compiles down to, and the plethora of ones we didn't mention, um, it, it all kind of boils down to that when we meet together, we are able to encourage and strengthen each other as we together, as fellow disciples, pursue walking in obedience to Jesus. And so this is something that is 
a universal truth for the church as a whole. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus, this is true whether you're here at Awaken, whether you're at the church down the road or across the the world, that we need to be meeting together and gathering together because there are all of these things that the Lord lays out as, hey, part of being a disciple and making more disciples is teaching each other to walk in obedience. Um, And so that is something that, one, is a very universal truth. But it also, we have a practical application, and that's the reason that I'm up here, really, is because um, with groups, that, that really directly affects how we pursue meeting together throughout the week. Um, So what does that kind of look like, or how has that looked like practically in the past? So, yeah, so in in the past, uh, we had two ways of doing groups. Um, And what we've done is we've kind of created this um, divide inadvertently. And so what we've had is we have had two. We have had one is like a large scale group meeting where it's like about 14 people. And what we said was it was like a social platform for spiritual growth. And so oftentimes it was based off of a topic. It was based off of a book. Recently, we started doing some more sermon based ones. And but that was about it. It it really was more on topic. It was more on the book. and, And that was kind of the gist of it. And you had people that were married. You had people that were single. You had people with young families, older families Like you had a a whole mix of people. And that was Awaken Groups. And then on the other side, option number two was D Groups. And uh, D Groups was more gender specific. It was about maybe five people. And it was really just studying through God's word. That Those were kind of the two ways. And like I said, what we did was we inadvertently kind of created this divide that you either have to pursue community or you pursue your spiritual understanding. And that's your choice. The reality is you need both of them as you're trying to follow after the Lord. We do need each other, and we should be looking into what God's Word has to say, because at the end, this is all that really matters. God's Word is the thing. It never changes. It's always the same. This is the thing like we stand on, we believe on, we preach from this. So um, so this is the thing that never changes. And so we've, we've tried to through lots of prayer, lots of discussion. Like, I really do. Like, Pastor Devon and Breezy have done such a great job with groups and and coming at this from this angle. And so I, I'm really excited to have her share uh, what groups is going to look like moving forward. Yeah, so moving forward, the new vision for Awaken Groups um, is Awaken Groups growing together as disciples of Christ. And so there's not going to be the separation between, oh, there's an Awaken Group and then there's D Groups. The only, like, they are united under the exact same vision that we are disciples of Jesus, people who have decided, yes, I want to learn from Jesus and walk with fellow disciples, and we are going to do that together. That is the unifying vision of every single group that meets. Now, some groups might be larger. Some groups might be gender specific. Some groups might be based on families. That is okay, Um, and that's welcome, depending on where you're at, what season of life you're in, what it is that, that you need. But the truth is, the fact remains that we are all disciples, and we should be leaning into finding out the truth of who Jesus is through the study of his word and walking in accountability with each other. And so that is the overall vision for all groups here at Awaken. And so um, one of the things that you will notice about every single group is they are going to be, like Nate said, focused on the study of God's word first and foremost, um, because this is where we find truth. This is where we find the hope that um, of, of our salvation. And this is basically life for us. This is what gives us life. And so together, we're going to study um, either a individual book of the Bible, as your group has decided, um, the scripture that the message is based on, or through the Bible reading plan together. Um, And the hope is that as you study, as you get into the word for yourself, as you read these things, one, ask questions. Don't feel silly asking questions. We, We tell that to Awaken students all the time, and they ask questions, and I'm like, dang, that was you don't even understand how like much you get it right now. And and so ask questions, 
do some research, look at what it means historically um, for the purpose not of just gaining knowledge, but then being able to walk in obedience to the things that um, we have been called to do, understanding more of who God is, the truth of who he is, and that we would be encouraged by that and that we would find hope in that and that we would genuinely be disciples of Christ, learning from him, actively pursuing those things. Um, And that it is something so beautiful that we get to do that together because it's so nice to know and look out into this room and, and go, okay, they are disciples too. They are striving after Christ. We are all learning and growing from him through his spirit, through his word. And I can go to anybody specifically here, but even more uniquely in our group and go, hey, Like, this is what I'm learning. How do I walk this out well? And so I just want to encourage you. We still have spots available for groups. And if there's one that you're like, hey, none of these work for me, okay, let's make something happen. Um, Because the truth is that it's not anything uniquely wonderful about what we're doing here. It's not like, oh, we have the special formula and you have to be involved in this way. The truth is our desire is that we as the church would be walking together after Jesus. And that does look a little bit different for everybody. You know, like I said, the groups will look different depending on just different life situations. But we want everybody to be included in striving after the truth of who Jesus is together and walking in obedience to him and what that looks like. And so if you have questions, you can go to the website um, and get answers or just come find me in the lobby. I'd, I prefer in-person conversations. Um, plus, then I can explain things that I can't always over text. So just come find me. I'd love to help you get plugged in. Yeah, and I I hope today was helpful. It's a little bit different than what we normally do, but uh, I do hope today was helpful. I hope it brings some clarity of what we're doing and where we're going. Um, and uh, what it means to even be a disciple of Jesus. But I I do also just want to say, like, and kind of close with this thought, I heard uh, a while back, like, um, the Chinese church, long, long, long time ago, they had this proverb, and it said um, that uh, there was uh, no breakfast, no no Bible, no breakfast. That's what they said. And uh, I always thought that, I think that's kind of cool, because the reality is that they would not eat breakfast until they read their Bibles. And I think about us right now. I think for a lot of us, we're about to go un- eat uh, an ungodly amount of food. And how many of us, though, have read our Bibles, though? You know, like if if we really, truly believe like we some of us, we just come here on a Sunday, we feed spiritually this one time a week and then that's it. And then we go and we live our lives and it's kind of disconnected and it's kind of the church thing. And and I do this on Sunday when it's convenient, when it when I can make it happen. But the reality is, I think we could all live by that Chinese proverb that says no, no Bible, no breakfast. And I think for a lot of us, at least for me, too, I'd be losing a lot of weight if that was the case, too, you know, because we don't want to starve ourselves spiritually. So uh, we don't want to starve ourselves uh, physically. So why do we want to starve ourselves spiritually? Uh, we need to be eating. And that's, that's the whole idea of this, is that we want to create a hunger and a thirst for God's word. Because though flowers may fade and, and the grass withers and the flowers fade, but God's word stands forever. And... Um, uh, so we really do believe in God's word. We stand on God's word. We believe in it. And so um, that's, that's really the idea here is to make sure that we are uh, constantly in God's word, that we are a people known by God's word, and uh, we do teach God's word as well. And so we want this to just be our foundation because when life hits, when we go through things, this is the thing that will keep us stable. This will be the thing that keeps us going in life. So um, next week, uh, we're going to be in James, and uh, we're going to be in James 1 one through four, so you can read that. And uh, how many of you going through a trial right now? Count it all joy, and I'll tell you about it next week, all right?